everyone and welcome to the December monthly update video for Victoria 3. I'm Sanna, part of the community team for Victoria, and in this video we're going to don our helmets and head straight into a long-awaited topic, war. But first, let's talk about the very concept of war in Victoria 3. Just like Victoria 3 itself is governed by a set of design pillars, so is warfare. First, war is a continuation of diplomacy. This pillar is something we have talked a lot about in previous dev diaries, that anything you can get through war, you should be able to get through diplomacy. War is strategic. The decisions you make about warfare are strategic, not tactical. What this means is actually that there are no units that you move in provinces. Instead, warfare is entirely front-based and all about the big strategic decisions you make during war. War is costly. There is no such thing as a bloodless war. In addition to the immense monetary costs, there is also a human cost in war, which begins the moment you mobilize your troops, as men start dying in training accidents, disease, or are injured and sent home to become dependents. Preparation is key. Many of the most important decisions about the war are actually made before the war starts, such as whether you have promoted your generals because they are the best generals you have, or simply because they're the most politically expedient and you need the support of their interest group. Navies matter. Our ambition is that in Victoria 3, for many countries, navies should be just as important, if not more important, than armies. Your navy is crucial to waging economic warfare on your enemies, protecting your own trade and supply lines, and maintaining your overseas colonial empire. And the final pillar is war changes. The 19th century was a time of immense change, going from the post-Napoleonic battlefields to the trenches of World War I. And this change should be felt in the mechanics of Victoria III, that warfare should feel different at the start of the game than towards the end. Now that we're armed with a knowledge of the philosophy behind warfare in Victoria III, let's take a closer look at fronts and generals. In Victoria III, all action during the war takes place on fronts. Fronts are created automatically as two countries uh, go to war, actually as soon as they oppose each other in a diplomatic play and consist of the border provinces between those two countries. There can, of course, be multiple fronts between countries, uh, maybe even in different parts of the world. Uh, and these are the regions where the battles uh, take place and which also move to show uh, how the war is progressing. Your fronts show you how well the war is going. Uh, if they have advanced far into enemy territory, the war is probably going quite well for you. If it seems like you're outclassed on this front because you have fewer battalions uh, than the enemy, uh, then maybe you need to send another general there. So this is your uh, interface and way to interact with your war. Because you're interacting with fronts and generals, you always have a manageable number of things to work with, whether it's an early game conflict over a single piece of land or a late game world war with enormous armies all over the world. Generals are important because they're the men who command your soldiers and officers. They're the ones who you recruit from different strategic regions and command the men in those regions. You assign them to fronts and depending on what rank they are in your army, they're able to send more and more men into the very jaws of battle. The troops themselves are drawn from actual places in your country. They are geographically connected to various regions as well, just like your generals themselves are. And when you assign them to a front, they go from wherever they were to wherever the front is. And your general is in charge of making sure that they're able to get there in time. Your generals also have certain ranks, which means that they're able to command more troops at any given time. They are connected with interest groups. They're oftentimes a member of the armed forces because they are generals. Sometimes a general can be drawn from the old landed aristocracy, therefore they're part of the landed interest. Sometimes a general could have come up through the ranks. Maybe he was a civilian laborer before all this, so he's a member of the trade unionists. Generals also have traits related to their skills in battle. They can be specialists in mountainous warfare. 
They could be particularly adept on defense or, or the attack. But also, battles themselves can give generals their own sorts of conditions. Uh, maybe their time at the front left them a bit shell-shocked or scarred. These can be health traits that then affect the life of the general or change their behavior a little bit. Orders are important because they're what tell generals to do different things during a war. They can advance if the moment is right, if it feels like the enemy is retreating. They can defend because sometimes the enemy is a bit too strong, maybe the moment isn't right, maybe it's winter time and you don't want to charge deep into enemy territory during the winter. Mobilization is one of the orders that you can give a general. Generals can't really do much else unless you tell them to mobilize. That's what gets them active, that's what gets the soldiers active. You need to mobilize in order to fully have your army ready for war. Mobilization is important to get the full strength of your army. You may have a standing army already, but you're not going to get all the men that you can potentially get unless you also mobilize. Battalions work by drawing on about a thousand or so men each of soldiers and officers. Battles are the result of when you tell a general to advance and there's somebody else there to defend. When you have one army advancing and another army defending, you have a battle. That battle is only decided once one force decides to withdraw. If the defender withdraws, you're, the advancing front advances. If the advancing army withdraws, the defender wins and the front stays where it is. Battles are affected by a lot of different factors. The very terrain that the battles happen on is a factor in both how the soldiers themselves fight and on what bonuses a general may have. The generals themselves, of course, play their own role in this. They have their own skills, their own ability to defend and attack at different levels. And uh, just the sheer manpower at play can make a major difference on how, how a battle turns out. Now, how is one to rule the waves if one does not have a Grand Navy? Our next topic is about navies and admirals. The Victorian era is a period where we see the emergence of truly global trade, and navies became really important. The sea didn't just feel like it was another front in the war. It served its own distinct purpose. Your navy can't win a war all on its own, but it can help and supplement the land warfare uh, efforts. The way you interact with the naval system in Victoria III is via your admirals. And admirals function in much the same way as generals. They have specific traits and they have troops called flotillas that work underneath of them. The orders that you give to admirals are a little more specific than the ones you give to generals. They're more akin to missions. Intercept orders an admiral to protect the coastline from naval invasions, for example. The patrol order tells an admiral to protect convoys that form shipping lanes. Conversely, the convoy raid order would tell your admiral to go and raid the enemy's convoys. Naval invasion is an order that you can give to an admiral to assist a general in opening up a new overseas front. We're also currently experimenting with the fifth order, blockade, which would uh, disable enemy ports and block straits. I mentioned convoys, which is a civilian vessel that transports goods for you across your supply network. The supply network is made up of individual shipping lanes, which are automatically established to ensure that goods move from point A to point B when they need to. For example, when you establish a trade route with another market or send a general overseas. This is where the patrol and convoy raid orders become really important because as a global empire, you can't expect to rely only on internal goods. You need your trade. And if your enemy can convoy raid your shipping lines during the war, they will affect you in all kinds of ways. A flotilla is the equivalent of a battalion at sea. They are created by naval bases who employ servicemen and officers in order to staff them. While battalions aren't raised overnight either, Flotillas do take a long time to build and upgrade. As a result, you have to make sure that you plan ahead for when you need your navy. Navies are pretty expensive, so this is going to be an investment for you, for you to make. On the other hand, you benefit from navies even in peacetime, because they give you a lot of prestige. 
When it comes down to it, there are few true winners in the aftermath. Our next topic is on the cost of war. War is expensive, not just in money, but also in people and lasting impacts on your country. We feel this is both thematic for the era, because this was the era when war really became an astronomically expensive affair. It's also important for the diplomatic pillar of the game, because with war being so expensive, it's often much, much better if you can solve these problems before war breaks out. Because these costs are modeled in our economic system, the impact on your country doesn't have to be terrible in all respects. Some pops may get really happy if your war is really expensive, particularly the owners of the arms industries. An important aspect of your country that defines how much your war is going to cost you is your army model law. This law determines how your army is managed and who holds the power within it. So under all these army model laws, you can raise conscripts from the civilian population. This is your option and comes at a potentially huge cost. Conscripts can only be raised while the country is at war or during a diplomatic play. And you can opt to either raise all conscripts, as many as you, you want, or from individual states one at a time. As conscription is activated in a state, what happens is that a conscription center building appears there, who will start to recruit pops from the civilian population, thereby reducing the throughput of the industries that they worked in. This can, of course, disrupt your countrywide or local economy, and it will also have lasting effects as the soldiers return home. Conscription is what recruits your civilian population to becoming soldiers. Mobilization of a general is what organizes the troops that that general has underneath that general to become active on the front. Mobilizing your troops under your general takes time based on the infrastructure in the state that the troops come from and also increases their goods consumption. So small arms, ammunition, artillery, all those things will be consumed in much greater quantities under mobilized generals. In addition, as soon as they're mobilized, battalions will start dying of attrition. This represents all of the ways in which a soldier could die that wasn't related to getting shot in combat. Whether casualties are inflicted through combat or attrition, you can compensate for this somewhat by providing good battlefield medicine on the front lines. Either way, some will die and some will simply return home now as dependents which could affect your country for generations to come. Of course, warfare changed a lot during the span of the game. This is reflected via technologies, but just because you research a technology doesn't mean that you automatically start gaining benefits from it. Normally, the technologies that you research unlock production methods in your barracks and naval bases. To activate these, you have to ensure that you have sufficient goods available to actually run them, and you may also want to hold off if you can't buy them at a good enough price. During the course of the game, you will see gradual revolutions in military technology, from post-Napoleonic era warfare up to planes, tanks, and combined arms. The final way in which war inflicts a cost upon your country is very physical, devastation. As battles are fought, the local surroundings take devastation damage, to its infrastructure and cause pops who live there to move away as soon as possible or even die. This devastation damage takes time to recover from. Even after a peace agreement has been reached, your pops will have to rebuild their country to recover from the war you were just in. And that is all for the December monthly update video. But we will be back again next month, as always, with more from our dev diaries. Until then, make sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, join the Discord, and subscribe to the Victoria 3 newsletter. See you next month.